chapter number four, beginning at verse number one, one through seven. It says this. Here's our story for the day. It says this. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what, ha do you, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in, shut the door behind yourselves and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went in from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. And, th and the vessels were full. And she said, son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. I'd like to share with us this morning from the topic, while the creditor is on his way, trust God. Tell your neighbor, while the creditor is on his way, trust God. If you've ever had letters in the mail, if you've ever got a text or an email from your bank or from some organization that you owe money to, if you've ever got a threatening correspondence from the fact that you didn't make your car payment and they're going to come and repossess your car, you know that the creditor is on his way. You've gotten that email or that mail in, uh, uh, in your house where it says you forgot to pay your CPS bill. You forgot to pay your water bill. And we're going to give you a chance to pay what you owe already and what you owe now. And we'll even put it on a payment plan for us, for you, to make it easier. But the truth of the matter is the creditor is on his way. You're either going to pay the bill or we're going to shut off the power. You're going to pay the bill or we'll stop the water from flowing. We're going to pay the bill or you're going to be out because you didn't pay your rent. Have you ever found yourself in a situation? I sit there and I, I can, I'd like to say I have not, but I've been in situations where I thought I paid the bill. Matter of fact, last week I paid a water bill, uh, electric bill, and I couldn't understand why it was so high. And when I go back to look at the bill, Sister Johnson, I realized I didn't pay last month's bill. So now I had to pay last month and this month. And I'm sitting there going, you got to pay it because the creditor is on his way. Uh, maybe some of the problems or predicaments that you and I are in today is because you and I have made foolish mistakes in the past, like I just explained. Or, or, or perhaps you're even in a situation or a mess that you didn't cause. It's not something of your own doing. It's just you are now in, in, the, in the midst of a situation in life that you had nothing to do with. I remember my father talking to me about the hardships of the Great Depression in the 1930s. The Great Depression of the United States lasted from 1929 to about 1939, where there was an economic distress all around the globe. It wasn't just in the United States. It was the longest and most severe depression that we've ever exper experienced in the industrialized Western world. Uh, there were food lines just to eat. There were lines uh, to go get money out of the banks, but the banks had no money. Can you imagine going to your ATM and you can't get money out? You say, well, when I go to the grocery store and I swipe my card to get the groceries, I'll get cash then and come to find out your card's no good. So not only are you not going to get cash there, you're not going to get food there. So there's lines for food. There's no money in the banks. There's extreme unemployment. There's poverty all across the country and heartache, and everybody's trying to figure out how we're going to make ends meet. And while all that's going on in 1929 to 1939, the banks still want their money. I'm telling you, the credit is on his way. Now fast forward to today. One of our saving graces that we like to think about today is we're going through something from the end of 2019 all the way until now, 
we got in, we woke up one day and found out we had something in the world called COVID-19. We didn't ask for it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We just found out that there is something called a pandemic and it's gonna affect everybody. And I think most people felt like, oh yeah, sure. And they didn't realize that a pandemic means it's everywhere. So there's no way we could have gotten into a car or gotten on a plane and went to another country to find relief. It was everywhere and it is still affecting us today. We like to think of the fact though that even though we all went through it together through quarantine and wearing masks, getting shots or not, going to church or not, going to the grocery store or not, uh, we all have been affected by it. And it gives us a little bit of solace and a little bit of encouragement to figure out that we were all in it together. It's not just me. We're all going through it together. But can you imagine if you get laid off, but your friend doesn't? You get your car repossessed, but your friend doesn't. All of a sudden, it feels like that, that you're in a lonely place, that you feel like I'm going, through, I'm going through hell and back, and everybody else seems to be prosperous, except me, yeah. except me. But God can do some extraordinary things with ordinary people. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, yeah. you just ain't seen it yet. But God's got a blessing for you. For those of you who dare to trust in God, while the creditor is on his way, trust God. Let me give you some background information on how we got to this text this morning. There's a prophet in the Old Testament by the name of Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha with an S. And this prophet existed in a time when Israel had suffered because of Israel's own uh, 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 unrepentant immorality and idolatry. Sounds like the United States of America today. We are suffering because of our own immorality within the borders, not from outside. We as people, as human beings, we're just some selfish, arrogant, disobedient folks. And at this time, at this place, a famine had gone across the whole land. There is no food. People are struggling just to eat. The prophet of God had to, had, had, uh, were, the prophets of God were being murdered. And they were fleeing, running for their lives, running for their lives. But then in the midst of all of that sorrow, in the midst of all that craziness, these dreadful hard times, we find out that there is a wonderful woman of faith who starts to trust God in the midst of craziness. She started trusting God when it didn't look reasonable to trust God. She started trusting God when things were falling apart all around us. It gives us hope and, and, and strengthens our faith while the creditor is on his way. Trust God. Trust God. Listen, there are three things you need to know. If you're visiting with us, if you're visiting with us today, there's some note cards in your pew. There's some note cards in your pew. And there's a front and back. And it's just for you to keep track of what's going on. Because I found out this. Most people forget most of what I say, but they remember most of the little bullet points that they make. So the first bullet point I want you to make, number one, is evaluate your current situation. Evaluate your current situation. It's right there in verses 1 and 2. Uh, and notice this, notice this. Here in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 4, this widow was quite lonely in her struggle. Listen, you would have felt lonely too in 1929 during the Great Depression or in 2019 when all of a sudden people are dropping dead beside us and, and we're getting notices and mail and information and news blasts all across the TV all day, every day. It, it was a dangerous time. It was a time of uncertainty, scarcity. You don't know where to get a mask. Should you get a mask? or the mask a real deal or not. You didn't know what to believe. Everybody was in topsy-turvy crazy. Yeah. And, then, and then just when you think that you had figured it out intellectually, a friend dies, a relative dies, the, a, a church member dies, and people were dropping dead all around us. And we we're like, wait a minute, maybe this is the end times. Yeah. Yeah. You needed to take your car in for repair, but you don't know if you really want to take it in. Yeah. You need to go get some groceries, but you don't know if you want to go to the grocery store. Yeah. You needed to go pick up the kids from school, but can you take them back? It was a crazy time. It was a crazy time. It is still a crazy time. There was uncertainty. There, there, was, there was death all around us. There was craziness. And the widow, 
Her food, her means of income uh, was gone because the story starts off by saying she's a widow. Her husband had died and he was a preacher. It says he was a prophet and he was one of the sons of the prophets. Let me explain. In Old Testament times, they had a group of people training prophets to be more effective at what they do. Elijah and Elisha had this school, a seminary, if you will, for pastors, for preachers, for prophets in the Old Testament times. And so I, I read to you a few moments ago that in those days, the prophets were running for their lives. Why? Nobody wants to hear the truth when you're the problem. Nobody wants to hear the truth when you are the problem. In other words, if we shut them down, they won't tell us about our sin. If we kill them, we don't have to listen if they tell us we're living in an adulterous generation. So let's just kill them. So here you are now sharing God's word with God's people for their salvation so they can go to heaven. We don't want to hear that mess. I want to live in my dirt. I want to live in my sin. So they were running for their lives or they were dead. Now, we're not told whether her husband was killed, but we know he's not alive anymore. That's all we know. Also, you need to know some background information in those days, in those days, in those days. The husband or the sons, the men, the males of the family in that culture provided the covering for the family and for the wives and for the daughters and for their sisters. So when a man dies, he leaves his family destitute. See, see, the men of the city only dealt with the men. The wives and the kids, you just stay in the house till we finish doing man stuff. And so when he left, there's nobody to do business for the family. They won't talk to her, and they won't talk to the boys because they're just boys. So now they're going to sit there and be in a house they can't afford, live in a city they can't work in, and be destitute for the rest of their lives. Somebody needs some help because... The creditor is on the way. But trust God. Ah! Ah! It was, it, it was, it was a dark time, y'all. It was a dark time. It was a dark time. It was a dark time. And so he asked her a couple of questions. Elijah, the prophet of God, who had done miracles, as we found out last Sunday. Miracles, miracles. He's been doing miracles. He asked her a couple of questions. He said, what shall I do for you? Tell me. And then the second question is, what do you have in the house? If you need to understand, there's a reason he has to ask these questions. Let me ask you, whatever situation you're in, uh, church, what can I do for you? I'm asking. And secondly, what's in your house? They ask it every time on television. They say, what's in your wallet? In other words, what do you got to work with? You got something. What do you got to work with? Are you hard-pressed right now? Seriously, I'm asking, are you hard-pressed? Are you going through a difficult time in your life and you feel like there's no way out? I've been going through COVID, jobs have shut down. The ones that are left only pay a, a, a piddly a bit, a bit, of my, a bit of money, so I can't even pay rent for what's available. I, I, I'm struggling in my relationships. I'm struggling in my finances. I'm struggling with my health. And, and, and I just don't see any end to all this. Ah! How can I help you? And what do you have? What do you have in your house? Ah! And, and coming to the prophet, she was in essence coming to a man of God who she believed could get a prayer through. Don't you do that sometimes? You go through a difficult time. You know you can pray. Matter of fact, God has equipped you to pray. But every now and then you realize I need to be praying with a saint who can help me get a prayer through. Have you done it? Have you done it? When you call up a friend from the church and say, Sister, pray for me. I'm going through a tough time right now. Brother, pray for me right now. I'm going through a difficult time right now. I need, I need to know that there's somebody praying with me and praying for me. Because right now I'm feeling kind of lonely right now. I'm feeling kind of out on the outskirts right now. I feel like I'm the only one going through right now. Ah, he asked her a couple of questions. What can I do? But also, what do you have? What do you have that, 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 that can help you get through these dark days? Listen, she said, I don't have anything. 
comma, conjunction, except. I don't have anything except. Anything, that conjunction except or but means whatever I said before is different from what I'm about to say. I don't have anything but a little bit of oil. You got something. Somebody tell, tell your neighbor, you got something. Tell, tell them, tell them, you got something. It may not be, it may not, it may not be all that you think you need, but you got something. Have you been there? Have you been there? I, 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 told, I told the story many times when I was growing up in, I was in college in Houston, and uh, I didn't have much, Brother Robert, but I had some baked potatoes. I had some potatoes, and I learned, Mama taught me how to take baked them potatoes, so I'd pop them in a microwave oven. And then, Sister Benita, I'd take whatever is in the refrigerator. It could be broccoli and vegetables. I had some old leftover chili. I baked that potato, split it open, took everything I had in the refrigerator, put it on top of that thing. Now I got supper. You ain't listening. You ain't listening. Shoot. You get a baked potato, you got something. Okay, so the next day I get home from school, and I don't put everything I had in the refrigerator on that potato, but I still got a potato left. So what do I do? I put that bad boy in the microwave, zip it till it's nice and hot, and I split it open, and I said, hmm. Butter, butter, salt, pepper. I got, you got something. When we say in America we ain't got nothing, what we mean is we don't have what we want. All right, but you got something, Charles. You, you got something, Anita. We got, we got something. When you say you ain't got nothing, that means you open the refrigerator and you don't hear nothing, you don't see nothing. Now that's when you ain't got nothing. But you do have a refrigerator. You're not listening. You can go borrow some food. You, you hear what I'm saying? You can go down to the pantry and, and people will give you food. So you got something. You got something. It's not what you want. Listen, it may be, it may not be filet mignon, but you may have bologna. You may have a can of star kiss tuna. But you got something. Listen, and, and, and uh, since I'm testifying, let me just finish. I had some tuna one time like that. But then I was upset because I couldn't find a can opener. Listen, if you take a knife, <laughs> Rob, Rob, you're not listening. If you take a knife and just go all around that can and then you pry that thing open, if you don't get it open, you wasn't hungry. You, you wasn't hungry. No, you got something. You got something. You got something. The problem isn't whether God is trying to help us, y'all. She said, I got oil. What can you do with oil? Well, you can cook with some oil. You, you, can, also, you, can, also, you can also bless people with oil. There's anointing being done with olive oil. There's healing in the Bible with oil. So you got something. You got something that can heal. You got something that can anoint. You got something you can fry some fish with. But you got something. God is speaking. He's always speaking to us. And he speaks. How does God speak to us so I can know how to deal with my problem? After we sit down, after we leave this service today, and I leave the church, what can I get out of this? How can I hear God speaking to me if there's not a prophet standing next to me? Well, God is speaking to us. His evidence is through Scripture. You got a Bible like I do, but if we don't use it or if you got it on your phone, open it up. Turn it on. Listen to God speak to you through the passages of Scripture. Secondly, he's witnessing to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit will encourage you and warn you. Have you ever been around some bad folk? You know you ain't got no business being around, and the Lord is like nudging you and saying, like, no, you know you need to go home. You know he ain't no good. You know she ain't no good. And, and you sit there going, yeah, but they my friend. Now they ain't that much of your friend. They really ain't. And then you leave. That's the Holy Spirit telling you to stay out of trouble. Thirdly, God put men and women in our lives to help us. That's why we come to church. Yeah, you can stay at home and stream, but there's nobody to encourage you when you're going through a difficult time. Yeah, you can stream if you're sick and shut in, but you need to be in the house of God where God can bless you and encourage you and challenge you and move on your behalf. You may have somebody who got a car they're trying to get rid of, and you're a person who will need a car. 
but you won't ever know it standing at home screaming. You better get to the, where the blessing is. And then fourthly, God blesses you to have a pastor to discern the passages and preach them to us in a way that makes some sense that we can use it today. God is still speaking. We're just not always listening. I think one of the reasons we don't listen is one, we don't want to know. We don't want to know. Because if I listen, and if God tells me, now I got to do something about it. While the creditor is on the way, trust God. Yeah. Secondly, 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 find the something in your nothing. Find the something in your nothing. I already alluded to it already. We always say, I ain't got nothing. And he said, no, you got something. Find that, that something in your nothing, in our nothing. Uh, uh, while the creditor was on his way, she was told, now this is what you do. Listen, y'all, re repeat after me. Faith, Faith requires, requires me, me to do something. Wait a minute now, now, wait a minute now. Wow, James says, you know, faith without works is a dead faith. In other words, if you say you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you don't pray and then get up and go do something about the prayer you just prayed, your faith is a worthless kind of faith. You ought to have enough faith in God to get up and go do something about what you just prayed for. So what did he do? He tells her to do something crazy. He tells her to do something outlandish. But listen, when your back is up against the wall, your car don't run, the house is about to get repossessed, and your sons are about to get sold into slavery, you learn to start doing something that you ain't never done before. He said, do this. He says, now, go door to door. Knock on your neighbor's door. You know the neighbors we don't talk to? You know the neighbors we pass by and we just kind of wave, and we give that nice little neighborly wave? We push the button, our garage door goes up, we drive the car in, the garage door goes down. Or we just pull into the driveway, we just kind of do the little cute neighborly wave, and then we go right to the front door, go in and shut the door. We don't ever speak to them. Yeah, those neighbors. Go ask them. Go, go ask them. Go ask them for some empty containers. Go ask them for some help today. Uh, everybody, ask everybody. Explain to them what the prophet told you to do. Now, first of all, even if, the, if they ask, and people are going to start asking, did you see her coming around asking for containers? Yeah, she's been by my house already, too. She's she coming down your way next. You know people are talking. They don't add that in the commentary, but you can know just by human interaction, people want to know what's going on in the community. She came out of her house. Remember the one? Her husband died? Yeah, she's the one with the two boys. She came to my house and just asked for containers. There's two words for the containers. The container, or that she used in verse number two, means little cup. But the prophet told her to go out and get some storage containers. <laughs> See, she went out and got a, a, a cup of oil. He says, she, he said, what do you got? I ain't got nothing except a cup of oil. He said, yeah, but I need you to go get a, a trash barrel of, 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 of containers. So she went and got containers about the size of trash barrels, these 10 and 50 and 20 gallon barrels that you can fill up with water or trash. And no matter what they gave her, she took. If they gave her a big container, she took it. If she gave a small, if they offered a small container, she took it. By faith, she had to believe that what they were offering was what she needed. In other words, when you need God to bless you, don't turn up your nose because you don't like the source or you don't like the blessing. If you're asking for clothes and somebody give you a suit or a pair of pants or some socks, don't sit there and go like, you don't have anything in blue? I thought maybe, you know, something a little more current. This is kind of old-fashioned. No! God is trying to bless you. But too many times the blessing comes packaged in a way that checks us to make us, or you do you really need it? Or are you just so full of yourself, so snooty that you can't take a blessing when it looks less than what you think it ought to be? So the prophet sent her to go out and get barrels. And so when she came in, the story goes on to say, and she came into the house and she decided to start trusting God. Humanly speaking, it was a strange thing 
for him to ask her to do. But strange times call for strange yes. blessings. Listen, as citizens out in the Midwest, when we found out that right now in America, there's been floods in the Midwest this week and last week, and people are now pushing mud and water and old furniture out of their house now because their houses have been underwater. In the West, California, people are sifting through ashes trying to find leftover stuff of what used to be a house but it's nothing there but ashes. It's never easy, no, but it's often a season when we go through trials, it's often a season of discovery and trust in God. God says, now, you don't have a house anymore. Yours is flooded and yours is burned down. Will you still trust me? See, it never was about the house in the first place. It's always been about you. Listen, y'all, God ain't coming back for houses and cars and jewelry. God's coming back for us. And he wants you to be gold-like in your faith in him. When we discover that there is something in our nothingness, then we can make room for God to have to, to grow the faith that is inside of us. You see, Elisha did something very good here. He took responsibility by saying, how can I help you? But he also taught her responsibility by asking, what do you got? Yeah. See, if I feed you only, you can eat for the day. But if I teach you how to fish, you can eat for a lifetime. So what he was doing is saying, I, I can help you for a moment, but you and your boys going to need to eat after I'm gone. When the priest ain't here no more, you still need to be able to eat. Elisha uh, advised the woman, lean on your neighbors. Listen, y'all, let me help you with something real quick. We are not in this thing called life by ourselves. That's why God gave us a church family. That's why God gave us neighbors. That's why God gave us family. And that's why God teaches us how to, re how to re have a relationship with each other. Because when we burn one bridge, we better hope there's another one. We're so busy trying to be independent. One of the problems we have in the United States of America, now I can't speak for everywhere, but I know in this nation, we have that old independent self, pull yourself up by the bootstrap theology in our heads and our hearts. We've been looking at too many movies. God didn't tell us to be independent. He told us to be interdependent. I need you, you need me. I got something you need, you got something I need. Nobody has it all. Even when it comes to the spiritual gifts that are in the Bible, he doesn't give Pastor Howlton or anybody in this group all the spiritual gifts because if you had all of them, you'd be God. You, <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't need nobody and you would show that you don't need nobody. But y'all, when we stay at home and we refuse to come worship God in his sanctuary, we're saying, God, no, 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 I'm good. I don't need anything. I'll stay home. But let calamity hit your house. Let calamity burn yours down. I'm not wishing that on anybody, but I'm saying when the hard times come, that's when we start finding out who our real church family is. We had a young man who used to go to this church years ago, years ago, he had, and, and he, he was in a tragic situation, and he had to have surgery. And he was telling me, he ain't worried about all that, because he got hundreds of friends, hundreds of friends, and, and they're going to all come see me when I have my surgery. Come to show up to visit with him, and he said, you the only one who's come in to visit me, and the family at, at Skybridge. He says, the Skybridge family visited me checked on me and checked on my family while I was in surgery and after I got out. He says, I thought I had friends. And they all said, man, we got your back. We got your back. You need anything, dog? You know, I'm there for you. I'm down with you, man. I said, hey, they may be down, but they're not down with you. But your church family is. Your church family is. Listen, our capacity to receive God's blessings can't outlast his ability to provide them. <laughs> he said, this is all you got, but this is all I got. I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it all in. Ah! The mama says to her sons, the boys who are getting ready to be sold into slavery. She said, go get me another vessel. And they said to her, mama, that's it. We ain't got no more. All the vessels that we got from all the neighbors, they're all empty. They're all filled now. 
And the Bible says, when the son made that proclamation, the oil that she was pouring from this stopped. How do you take this and fill up a barrel? And then you go to the next one and fill up a barrel with this. And you go to the next one and fill up a barrel. And to the next one. And you fill up a barrel, a big trash flowing. And it kept flowing and it kept flowing until they said, we don't have any more. That's what God does to us, y'all. God's divine power. Why didn't he do it before? He was cultivating her faith. It, 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 God's divine power waited for faith and action. His manifestation of works was in concert with her faith and her believing. So what are you trusting God for today? Have you trusted God intellectually? You think, you, you're pretty sure he can do it, but you haven't moved out by faith to start trusting him. Maybe God is trying to get your attention too. Listen, listen it's time for us to stop playing church. Stop pretending like we have faith and move out. Faith means we got to get up. Faith means we got to base our, our belief in trusting in God's word and do what he says do. It's easy when everything in life is going good. It's easy when you get into that school you've been applying for. It's easy when you get that promotion that you think you deserve. It's easy when they get, the kids are coming home with A's and B's and getting on the sports team. It's easy, but wait till the bottom falls out and there's nobody on your side and it looks like there's no hope and no joy. Find the something in your nothing. Lastly, lastly, if you keep keeping notes, first, evaluate your current situation. Secondly, find the something in your nothing. Lastly, thirdly, rest in God's provision. Yeah. Rest in God's provision. It's right there in verse number seven. It says this. She came and she told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the rest. Listen, God's fingerprints are all over this story. God's fingerprints are all over this, are all over this story. Uh, 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 Elisha caused her to take a little cup to pour into large containers. You see, God has to have something to say about that. Uh, the same God, the same God that was able to do great works with a little bit of stuff. In the Old Testament, Moses returns from the backside of the desert to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But all he had was a stick in his hand, a staff. Yeah. All she had was a cup. Moses had a stick. David used a slingshot. Uh, 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 the little boy with the, with the five loaves of bread and the two fishes, that's all he had. But God is able to take little and give much. But it comes with David has to trust God with a slingshot. Moses has to trust God with a stick. The woman has to trust God with a little bit of cup of, a cup of oil. The creditor was paid. The creditor was paid. The guy that was coming to take her son. The guy that was coming that would have kicked her out of her house. The guy that was coming showed up and she must have sat there and go like, how much do I owe you? Do you pay cash or credit? Because I can do it that way too. I can, do, I can, you, can I swipe? I can swipe. Do you take debt? I put it in there. How much do you need? Because you're not getting my son. God made a way so I wouldn't have to sell my boy. God made a way when it didn't seem to be no way. God made a way for a little woman who had no standing, who had no position, who had no say-so, who had no hope, who had no future, to have hope, have a future. Keep her sons, keep her house. And the scripture says she had enough oil to pay a debt to pull two boys out of slavery and to live on for the rest of her life. Don't tell me God can't do it. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Turn to two people and say, God is able. 
Go ahead, tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him. Say, God is able. God is able. My God is an awesome God. He reigns. But that ain't the end of the story. Because God is so miraculous. Over 2,000 years ago, God poured himself out for us. Jesus poured himself out as we understand it. And all it means in Scripture in the New Testament when it says Jesus poured, he poured himself out. He, he allowed himself to be uh, uh, denied his privileges. Jesus is God in the flesh. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And God the Son left heaven, came down to earth, poured a little something into Mary, became a baby, lived for 33 and a half years. I tell you, he poured himself out. She poured out a little bit of oil. And remember, in Scripture, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. So when he poured himself out, he poured himself out for you and for me. And, 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 but he didn't just do that. He poured himself again uh, at the cross. He poured and allowed all the sins that we had to be poured onto him. He died on the cross, allowed them to pour him into a, a stony grave. But it was just a borrowed grave because he wasn't going to be there alone. Got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. And now that he has poured, he turns around and through the power of the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes, he pours into us. So when we say yes to Jesus Christ, he poured the Holy Spirit into us. And so now we walk around with the Spirit of God in us, not around us, in us. To everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 gives us the down payment assurance that he's coming back to get us. Because he lets us know all the work that I did for you. He said, you think I did work for that woman? That just got her food till she died. But what I'm giving you is going to keep you through eternity. So everything that I've poured into you is going to be in you until the day I call you home because you've been sealed with the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is your promise that I'm coming back to get you again. You don't hear me right now. You ought to celebrate the fact that God loves you so much. Ah, because see, Satan, the creditor, was coming to get, get you. But even when the creditor is on his way, trust God. Even when the creditor is on his way, trust God. Even when the tr creditor is on his way, trust God. Even when Satan is trying to break you down, tear you down, and make you feel like life ain't worth living no more, trust God. Trust God. Somebody give God praise in the house.